exactly the opposite, it was less than unemployment because the people that wanted servants couldn't get them because all those people could make more money working in the new factory. Right. So that <coughs> almost turned into a different situation where it was work for everybody. Well, what you're describing is absolutely true. Uh, the cost of servants tremendously increased. Uh, so people were better off in the factories. Servants. And so, so fewer people could afford servants. So that's why we don't have servants today, I guess, right? Uh, we have far fewer servants. And also, at the same time, uh, many innovations have made it possible for people to do for themselves what they previously needed servants for. So it's one thing to dump a load of clothes in a washing machine, and then a half an hour later, later you put them in a dryer. Uh, that beats the hell out of having to uh, scrub uh, each item in a bucket. So uh, it's much less painful uh, not to have the servants. Now, we probably would have more people having servants if we had uh, freer immigration. Uh, a ready uh, outlet. Uh, the, the, in the United States, uh, the middle class uh, does not employ many servants. Maybe they have a maid once a week or something. But uh, many uh, people uh, in the middle class could afford full-time servants if uh, their wage rates were much lower, as they would be if we had the large-scale immigration uh, from other from poorer countries. Yes. Oh, I agree with you 100%. I lived in South America for a few years, and yeah. it's like and I had a full-time maid, and you know, I only I, you know, I was a volunteer. I didn't even have a full-time job, but like everybody has a maid, you know, and I didn't have to make my bed, or make you know, wash the dishes, or mm -hmm. even cook, and you know, she just did everything, and it's just because she was willing to work for you know, like a dollar a day or something. Yeah. Yeah, but where would these people live? That came out, took that lower wage. There's no real estate available. Live in your house. Uh, there would be many live-in servants, probably. There would be many live-in servants. Yes. Could we think of the general process where everybody has to transition to acquire new skills and training? For example, the um, outsourcing was popular right now. Yeah. Um, most people are laid off, but they have to acquire coming back to school to acquire new skills. Yeah. Well, that, in the short run, affects the economy. Yeah. You know, then to prosper in the moment. Yeah, people, uh, there are always changes going on. Uh, people have to learn new skills. Uh, you can't expect to do the same job uh, from uh, late adolescence to old age. There's, the, uh, there's innovation. And uh, at one or more times in life, uh, the innovation may cost you your existing job. So uh, you need to learn fresh things. Now, uh, many people don't, or most people, in fact, uh, shouldn't be in the position of having to learn new skills after they've lost their job. I would say normally uh, you can see the loss coming and make preparation while you still have your job. And hopefully that's the situation of many of you uh, you're here getting a, a, a business degree uh, in the expectation that if you do lose your job, uh, it'll be much easier to find an alternative. Yes? Didn't we see a large example of this just recently, the, the reduction in the defense industry? We had this gigantic pool of people with degrees and advanced degrees who no longer had a particular way to put their services to use for pay. Right. And then had to learn additional skills to go to the marketplace to uh, kind of retool up a new employment. Yeah, exactly. Now that you're referring to uh, the uh, the 90s and uh, the end of the Cold War. Yeah, that was a, a, a large-scale conversion. And uh, people did have to uh, learn new skills for that. And your name, sir? Uh, James Davis. James, James Davis. Davis, right. Okay. Yes? Keith Wilson. Um, can we jump back to the uh, the destruction, fighting the destruction of property? You had a section in there about um, reincorporating the troops back into society and to... Oh, yeah, and has the disbanding troops and bureaucrats? Yeah. Right. Um, I'm just trying to put in kind of today's perspective where we try to keep an armed forces employed. I mean, from the, the way it rip, the way you wrote it was, you know, bring up the troops when they're needed and then kind of bring them back in and disband it when, you know, when the war is over. But, you know, how does that kind of really apply when we're still, you know, maintaining the troops and, and keeping them? Well, 
Hazlitt was writing in the context of the post-World War II years. And in World War II, we had an army, uh, a whole defense establishment, on the order of maybe 15 million people. Oh, what's it right now? Uh, now, what is it, maybe 2 million or so? Uh, maybe somewhat more? I think 1.5. 1.5? Okay. Well, and at that time when we had 15 million people, uh, the population of the whole country was only about 130 million. Now it's uh, close to 290 million. So uh, this was a massive uh, defense establishment, uh, which we had in order to win World War II. And uh, when the war ended, there was absolutely no rational basis for maintaining such an immense defense establishment. And many, many people were afraid uh, that if we disband the army, uh, there'll be a sudden massive unemployment in the civilian sector. Uh, what will the soldiers do? Well, uh, all you have to do is realize that uh, if we no longer need uh, to maintain a massive defense establishment, uh, then government spending uh, is in a position to drop dramatically. And it did fall uh, dramatically uh, between 1945 and 1946. In 1945, it was something on the order of $100 billion, which was huge uh, for that time. And in 1946, it was cut more than in half, uh, down to about $45 billion. Uh, now, this meant that uh, the government is spending $55 billion less there's $55 billion more remaining in the hands of the citizens. And so now they decide to spend it as they wish instead of the government buying huge quantities of tanks, planes, artillery shells, and whatever. Uh, the individual citizens are out there buying automobiles, houses, uh, washing machines, etc. And uh, the uh, workers who had been producing for the war effort, and including uh, the soldiers and sailors, uh, they now shift into producing uh, for uh, peacetime use. So instead of having uh, uh, Detroit, uh, whoever is working in Detroit uh, producing Jeeps and tanks, uh, we now have uh, uh, the people in Detroit producing automobiles and trucks and joined uh, by returning soldiers. And so uh, we had a, a massive increase in civilian production and that's when uh, prosperity uh, really returned to the United States. Not in World War II, but uh, with the end of World War II. Yes? Did I, so that money was returned in theory, or the government cut spending in half. Is that money really returned to the citizens? Yeah. Did they cut taxes? Or they, tax they cut taxes uh, and they reduced uh, government borrowing. So instead of the government uh, raising certain sums of money through borrowing, it borrows less. Uh, there's more money available for civilian purposes. Yes? So, so my question is, um, it seems that each one of these principles that are argued by the author really speaks to free market. Uh-huh. Uh, and everything we've talked about so far, other parts of the book where it talks about, you know, let's not give this farmer uh, a low, low interest loan. Uh, we should allow the farmer, the farmer who is most efficient uh, to be the person who obtains the loan. It seems that the argument on the other side is that we don't di do this, and certain people would have the opportunity, you know, to economically thrive. With all that being said, my question is: that argument is free market. What does the market? What would the market? Give us a picture of what the market would look like. What would our country look like if it were completely free market? I would say it would be much more prosperous. Uh, people would be more contented. Uh, we'd have much better medical care. Uh, we'd have a much better school system. We'd have a much better highway system. Uh, in the same way that uh, we replace the horse and buggy with the automobile, we have tremendous progress wherever there is any significant element of economic freedom. We'd have that much more consistently. Let me add a component to my question. Yeah. Because I, I tend to agree with that. Pardon me? However, I tend to agree with that. Yeah. However, how do you explain, I mean, how do you uh, rebut the, the argument that is, that is made often? The reason why we need to have these controls, i.e. the farming example, is that if you don't, pop, mass pop, poverty will occur. 
for certain individuals would not be able to survive. Uh, but with your description you just made, yeah. it's all rosy. Everything is phenomenal, <laughs> everything is great. So so how do you how would you rebut the argument that is often made as to why that bridge is is built even though there's not a need for a bridge but we create jobs? You know, that that's a that's a consistent argument. How do you address that? I know the I think the major question you're asking uh, pertains to poverty. Uh, it's certainly true that developments can occur that will make certain groups of people poorer than they were before, at least temporarily. Like if the, the demand for their services drops, or there's some uh, competition that makes what they're doing obsolete, and so they can have uh, a short-run decline in their standard of living. But uh, always what's displace displacing them is a more efficient method of production, and uh, people are not frozen rigidly into what they have been doing, uh, they are almost always able to make some adjustment. And the result is that we have uh, continuing progress raising the general standard of living. Now, as for poverty, uh, I would say there's an awful lot that the government does that is making people unnecessarily poor. Uh, let's start, uh, uh, take something, first of all, like the minimum wage. Now, if you recognize the principle that the higher the price of anything is, the smaller the quantity demanded, if we make wage rates artificially high, that means the quantity of labor demanded will be lower, and it will be less than the number seeking employment. Uh, the effect of the minimum wage law is to compel some people who might have been employed to be unemployed. That's not improving them. If they, they could have been employed making something, and had they been employed, they would have probably acquired some skills, some better work habits. They would then have had the basis uh, for earning some more money later on. They'd have been better qualified by virtue of the work they had done. Now, that's, that's one instance. But then there are more. Uh, the government does not simply have a minimum wage for uh, low-skilled, unskilled workers. The, the minimum wage law applies to them. But... Uh, there are other things the government does that are very similar uh, for higher skilled workers. Uh, what would be examples of uh, the government in one form or another imposing minimum wages higher up the economic ladder? Well, what do labor unions attempt to do? Okay, labor unions are attempting to impose higher, artificially higher wage rates, in effect a minimum wage for skilled workers or semi-skilled workers, now, when they do that, what happens to the quantity of skilled and semi-skilled labor that's demanded at the higher wage rates? That's reduced, right? Now, that means there are fewer people employed as carpenters, plumbers, electricians, etc., than who might have been. And where do they go? Where do they go? They'll look for other jobs, lesser jobs, right? So they enlarge the supply of labor in lesser skilled areas. Now, in order to be absorbed in these lo lower skilled areas, what would have to happen to wage rates? They would have to be lower. See, labor unions and other devices that artificially wa raise wage rates in some areas have the uh, offsetting effect of reducing them in other areas because they reduce the number of people who can be employed at the artificially high wages. They cause a spillover of labor. They enlarge the supply elsewhere. And it'll depress wage rates lower down. Now suppose we have uh, this kind of arrangement prevailing throughout the economic system. Uh, people are being displaced from certain areas because of the elevation of wage rates. They fan out into other lesser areas. And in these other lesser areas, Suppose, uh, for whatever reason, either unions or uh, habit and custom, uh, the wage rates do not fall to absorb them. But if they're more skilled, more qualified, they're likely to become employed, and who will then lose their jobs? Lesser skilled people. And they'll crowd down. Uh, if they're more intelligent and ambitious than the people there, they can get employed. Uh, where does the process stop? Who ends up bearing the burden of the unemployment? The, the least skilled is a concentration at the bottom. Uh, the government is uh, powerfully depressing uh, the wage rates of poorer people 
uh, not just by denying them employment altogether uh, through a minimum wage, but in, uh, in depressing the wages that would be sufficient to employ them. Uh, suppose we uh, abolish the minimum wage law. Uh, uh, people at the bottom could get employed, but the wage rates might be horrendously low. What could we do to make it possible to employ more people at the bottom on better terms, to alleviate the pressure, so that as we are increasing the number of people working at the lowest jobs, uh, people presently working in such jobs could move up to higher jobs. What would we need to do to make that possible? We'll have that totally free up the labor market, abolish all artificial wage restrictions, so that uh, people who had the uh, skills and abilities could find employment by successfully competing higher up the ladder. Mm -hmm. uh, then we'd alleviate pressure at the bottom. And what would be the effect of uh, more people working at, at a higher level of skill and efficiency? What would be the effect of this on the supply of goods and on the prices of goods? They'd be less. So what would be the effect on the standard of living of poorer people? It would be increased. Now what if also uh, we didn't compel uh, miserably poor people uh, directly or indirectly to pay 15% of their earnings to Social Security? See, they're paying 7.5% directly out of their own wages, but what the employers are paying on their account, from the employer's point of view, that's part of their wages. Well, suppose the workers could get that. That would be a significant improvement. And similarly with all other fringe benefits. Then also, if we wanted to make the cost of living less, suppose we have free trade, make everything as inexpensive as possible. So uh, people, more people would be employed, they'd be employed on better terms than are otherwise possible, and they'd be getting goods cheaper. That would be a, a genuine anti-poverty program. Those would be the lines. Yes, and Dave, tell me again your name. Dave Rosenthal. Right. So supposing the, these theories are true, yeah. then can you pinpoint a reason or a set of reasons why we're not using them, why they're not employed by our government or, or the country? Well, I would say very few people are aware of the truth of these theories, and they have uh, mutually opposing ideas, uh, mutually exclusive ideas. Uh, they believe, it's, uh, there are, you can think of it this way, uh, there are two fundamentally radically opposed methods of pursuing material self-interest. Uh, one method is that of the free market. In the free market, you're not allowed to resort to force or fraud. You can't point a gun at anyone, you can't steal from him, you can't commit fraud. Okay, now, what if uh, the use of force is effectively taken off the table? And here you are, you want to serve your material self-interest. You want to be rich. What do you have to do if you cannot uh, commit robbery, fraud, or anything of that kind? You have to deal with people honestly. They will only deal with you voluntarily. What do you have to do to get people to deal with you voluntarily? You have to make it worth their while. You have to satisfy their self-interest. Well, this is uh, self-interest in a very positive, productive way. This is what generates all of our progress and prosperity. Uh, you want to make a fortune, uh, invent some new or better product or a more efficient method of producing an existing one. If you do that, uh, you're not only making your fortune, you're meeting the needs of the, of the buyers. And everyone who deals with you uh, does so to his advantage. Uh, that's the method of the free market. Relatively few people are aware of this or not aware of it very consistently. There is, uh, th they're more familiar with a different approach to self-interest, which you can think of in terms of uh, the mafioso. The mafia, uh, it, its members presumably want to have a higher standard of living too. But how do they go about getting it? Extortion. Yeah. Extortion. Uh, they'll break your legs if you don't pay them off. Uh, They'll stage stick-ups, robberies, whatever. And I think that many, many people think when you talk of self-interest and the profit motive, that's how they understand it. They think it means that people will be looting and plundering one another. That it'll be a mad, insane race. Yes? So you contend that it's ignorance? It's essentially ignorance, yeah. It's essentially ignorance. Yes? How, how does this 
John Castillo, by the way. How does, how does John the, what? John Castillo. Castillo, yeah. How does the, uh, the role of the United States and, and, and kind of how we fit internationally in some of our foreign policy dictate yeah. uh, a lot of what you're saying? You, you painted a pretty good picture here domestically, but I would assume that obviously we do a lot of things where the government spends a lot of dollars or back to the you know discretionary spending of the government. Uh, I would assume that a large portion of that's done internationally, which, oh, by the way, has probably caused us to, uh, to be the type of, of uh, nation that we are today. Uh, again, you talk domestically, how does internationally play a role into why the government isn't like the way you envision it? Well, I don't see the separation between international and domestic. The, the government does an awful lot of damage domestically as well as internationally. Well, foreign policy is the, is the way a lot of our government yeah. spends a lot of money. Or yeah. get a lot. <coughs> well, I don't think the government is getting money uh, from our international, from our foreign policy. But they're, they're certainly spending it. Um, yes, uh, and tell me again. Bob Weatherford. Bob can Weatherford. Kind of say, yeah, can, uh, applying to what John's saying, and frankly, you know, Right, right into minimum wages, you can turn around and say, take the biblical thing, yeah. you know, give a person a fish, feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, he uh -huh. can feed himself for a lifetime. Yeah. That instead of giving a, give them the means, and by free trade, you're giving other countries the means to support themselves, they can create goods that they can sell. They don't need us to give, or any other country, give foreign aid to them right. in, the, in the sense of a gift. So just like it is contended that we cripple people with welfare, yeah. we're crippling other countries with foreign aid. That if we had a true free market society, these pro many of these problems would not, or a free market world. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that you had in mind foreign aid, but th these are valid observations that uh, well, Mr. Right. Weatherford is making. The, the um, unnecessary discretionary thing that exists. Within the book. What do you mean discretionary spending? Well, I, I think that you pointed out, uh, or I believe it was pointed out in this book, that, yeah. that obviously anything more that the government spends, um, other than really necessity, roads, bridges, police, yeah. uh, military to defend the country, um, other than that, it's really kind of unwanted spending. Well, I think the distinction you're referring to that Hazlitt is making, uh, when he, he has the discussion, I think, of a bridge in connection with public works projects. And he says it's one thing if a bridge is needed uh, to facilitate the flow of traffic. We have bottlenecks, and so a bridge is really needed. And uh, he thinks that sort of government expenditure is legitimate. But uh, if the government is spending to build a bridge, uh, then you'd have to ask, other things equal, would they rather pay less or more? They'd rather pay less. Now, if their motive is not to have a bridge to solve some traffic problem, but their motive is to stimulate employment. If that's the idea, then uh, do they want a more expensive or a less expensive bridge? Then they'd actually want a more expensive bridge because their objective is not really the bridge, it's giving people the work to do uh, to produce the bridge. And he's totally opposed to that type of spending. He's saying uh, government spending uh, for public works uh, for the purpose of making employment, uh, that's uh, totally uh, destructive. Yes? Well, for the purposes of public works projects, even if they want to spend less, because of political pressures, they may spend more anyway because of prevailing wage. Because, for example, I know the federal government, Orange County is a great example. All public works projects must be prevailing wage because there's a stabilization agreement with the unions. So they're paying at least twice as much as they should be in labor just because of this agreement. Yeah, there's, uh, there are laws, I believe, that require that uh, government projects be carried out at union scales. And now, why do you think there are such laws? The unions, are the unions have a lot of money to contribute to political campaigns. Uh, they influence a large proportion of their membership. So if you're a politician and you're pursuing your political self-interest uh, just to get reelected, uh, then uh, you're going to be willing to enter into such deals. Now, uh, you're not getting the money uh, in your bank account. Probably not, but sometimes uh, that <laughs> happens too. But even if you don't get a penny in your bank account, uh, you're getting a payoff uh, through getting reelected. 
and their uh, government projects are undertaken uh, on this basis, uh, what's going to bring in the most campaign contributions? You see, it's not something, uh, what's the most economically profitable? If a business is engaged <coughs> in something, it wants to do something profitable, but when it's doing something profitable, it's dealing with customers who don't have to deal with it. It, it's, it, wants to, it has to satisfy the wants of the customers. It has to uh, serve the self-interest of everyone it's dealing with. When the government, when the politicians are doing something to their material self-interest, well, what underlies their ability to serve their self-interest? What is it that uh, leads us to have to pay twice the cost of projects because they've decided uh, to have this clause of paying union wages. Who foots the bill and on what basis? We do, and what makes us pay, to pay twice as much? What happens if you say, well, I know the story of this. It's a racket, and uh, uh, I'm deducting that sum uh, from my uh, quarterly tax payment. <laughs> what will happen to you? Uh, at some point, maybe after a succession of progressively nastier letters, uh, uh, you'll end up, th there'll be some armed officer at your door, and you'll be physically carted off. Isn't that a form of governmental extortion in itself? Yeah. You'd have to say that. Yes. What you could also do is, just like Arnold did, you can run for a political position and say, you know what, I'm not going to take any notice of those special interest people. I'm just going to go with what the people wanted. Mm -hmm. And that's how you break something like that. So as a, as a person, as an American, you have the right, you can run for political office and, and do that if you have the money to do it. But yep. it, didn't, it didn't work because we gave so much away on that budget that uh, continues the social welfare program of the legislature that, fine, he didn't take any special interest money. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. The budget that he compromised that he had to come through with still is still better than it was before. Uh, that's a matter of <laughs> It's certainly not a dramatic improvement. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, Mr. Boisio. Yeah. Uh, is there a society or country that is truly free market or has been uh, that is utilizing the policies that we're talking about now? And if so, was it or is it successful? Well, I would say uh, historically the United States came closest and uh, compared to most of the rest of the world is still relatively free. And the extent to which we have prosperity, I would say, depends on the free elements. I mean, it, it still is possible uh, for people to start new businesses, uh, to introduce brand new products, uh, new methods of production, and they do it on their own initiative uh, for their own profit. And so the economy is uh, still... Uh, uh, powered by that, but uh, there are more and more obstacles and barriers in the way. And I would say, if you look around at the world, uh, I think there's a pretty close correlation between the the freer the country, uh, the more prosperous. Yes. But is, is there in history an example of? I think that's where you're going, right? Is there? Well, I would say uh, th with the absence of uh, significant interference in wages, that was true uh, of the United States and, and Britain uh, through the 19th <laughs> century, and uh, there was tremendous economic progress. And uh, different countries are uh, attempting to move in that direction. Uh, some of the West European countries uh, have finally realized that the very high unemployment rates that they have may have something to do with the power of the labor unions in those countries. And so uh, they're attempting to, uh, to weaken that. Uh, you won't find them uh, confronting it head on, uh, but uh, I think that's implicit anyway. Yes. I'm sorry, just, in a, just very brief. Yeah. Your, the point you, you made very swiftly earlier 
about this free market and what, the, what, our, what we would look like if we yeah. have a free market. Yeah. Um, the most common argument that I get in, in terms of act, arguing capitalism versus socialism, let's say, yeah. um, in, in that battle that goes on in our economy presently, is how we're headed more and more towards the land of the have and have not. So when you talk about, when you talk about the issue of um, efficiency, mm -hmm. for example, right? Yeah. And we talk about innovation. Then, to your point, there are many individuals who have taken advantage. And I want to take advantage of innovation, and therefore, I can become wealthy. Yeah, I've done that. Okay. But then, arguably, there are uh, there's another group that, because of that innovation, they did not take the leap. They did not, <coughs> excuse me, learn new skills. Yeah. And so, so as a result, they arguably became poor. And so it appears that we've got this. Elimination of the middle class, there's the have, there's the have not. And I almost got you the last time you, you did it, because you basically the way you laid it out, everybody would be more prosperous, but yeah. those who are poor would become middle class. Yeah. I, I didn't quite. Darwin. No, it's not Darwin if everyone is, is improving. Uh, you see, if you think about it, you know, uh, people often think of capitalism as survival of the fittest, dog-eat-dog, right. dog, the rat race. Now, just consider, uh, we have uh, competition among the pharmaceutical manufacturers. What's the effect of their competition on the ability of the sick to survive? Uh, it enables the sick to recover. Uh, what's the effect of competition among uh, farmers and farm equipment manufacturers on the ability of the hungry to eat? That enables them to eat. Right. Now, you see, comp economic competition is not uh, like competition in the animal kingdom. Uh, the animals are competing for a scarce stock of nature-given necessities. Uh, there's only so many zebras in the jungle for the lions. The lions have no ability to enlarge the supply of zebras. Uh, economic competition is a competition in the positive creation of new and additional wealth. Uh, uh, IBM and Apple are competing not over grabbing computers off the computer trees, but they're competing in who can make a better, less expensive computer. And this is the nature of economic competition throughout, so it's <coughs> positively augmenting the supply of goods. Now, uh, if you think about it further, uh, what's the basic way you make a fortune if you can't resort to force or fraud? Okay, you have to introduce better products, or more efficiently produced products. What's the effect of that on the customers? It's improving it. It's improving it, right? And competition keeps passing the improvements forward. Uh, at one time, uh, the way Intel made money, they introduced the 8286 chip, and that was very profitable and the hottest item. Well, what happened when others started making the equivalent chip? Then there's no special profit in the 8286, they need the 8386, and then competition wipes out that profit. Well, what's uh, the net effect of this? Uh, people are getting better and better chips at lower and lower prices. And the same thing is true, really, across the board. We have automobiles introduced because someone made money. Uh, they're continually improved because someone made money, and it's this way up and down the line. So the way you make high profits is by introducing improvements. Mm -hmm. And then what do you do if you want to build a fortune the source of a fortune is essentially the reinvestment of high profits. Well, as the fortune is accumulated and reinvested, where is it? Well, it's in things like machines and factories, the means of production. And who are the means of production physically producing for? The general consuming public. See, if we have a society in which there are people able to get rich by virtue of the improvements they bring about in production, and then they save and reinvest that wealth in the further means of production, well, this is a society in which this tremendous means of production uh, using ever-improved technology. What's the effect of that on the supply of goods available for the masses? It's going up and up. And what's the effect if you have more wealthy business firms? What's the effect on the demand for labor? That goes up. So uh, the, the non-capitalists, uh, the people who are living by selling their labor, they're benefiting from the improved demand for labor and the improved supply of products that they buy. 
So there's a general benefit. Now, we don't observe everybody uh, having the highest level of prosperity, uh, in part because we have a, a heritage, the natural heritage of the human race was immense poverty. It took quite a while to elevate this. And we have a lot of interferences which stop it uh, from going further uh, of the kind I've illustrated. Now, uh, there are many people who are poorer and worse off, despite a lot of progress that's been going on. And this seems to be a great puzzle to many people. But at the same time, if you stop and think of people's attitudes uh, toward the cost of government regulation, like uh, the Environmental Protection Agency will impose regulations uh, that may cost tens of billions of dollars or even more. God knows what the total cost of the environmental regulations has been over the last 20 years. Now, who do most people think pays for this? They think companies. They think. I read an article in the New York Times a week or two ago uh, arguing that uh, uh, companies are paying 93% of the cost. Now, do you believe that if something is done that raises the cost of production, that this is coming out of profits for very long? No. It goes to uh, into higher prices. So uh, all of the new and additional regulations that are imposed, which serve to raise costs, and which most people think are coming out of the hides of the hated capitalists, they're actually coming out of the hides of consumers, and who, if they're at the lower end of the ladder, uh, they're being impoverished. We have uh, uncontrolled government regulation. See, so we have an attitude. Uh, uh, companies have to formulate the environmental impact of whatever they're doing. And who knows what that is? And that's pretty vague and undefined. But no one ever stops to consider what is the economic impact of these environmental regulations and other regulations. And if you're running up costs, uh, uh, tens and hundreds of billions of dollars without any concern, it shouldn't be all that amazing that uh, there are going to be a lot of people who are made unnecessarily poor. And so I would say, if you want to explain uh, a problem of poverty, the place to look is uh, the run up in costs uh, imposed by government regulation. That would bear a lot of investigation. Yes, Mr. Chung? Uh, along the same line is with the uh, government regulation, do you think that the benefit would shift to elsewhere? I mean, not necessarily, you know, diminish, you know, out the air. I mean, say, for instance, uh, the EPA, you know, they they impose, you know, different laws to, you know, uh, and fines and so forth from businesses if they violate the law. Mm -hmm. While that, that benefit would, would keep it, uh, I mean, the benefit of keeping the environment uh, safe and, and good and so forth yeah. does have an other benefit to other businesses, say, for instance, uh, uh, for farming and for, you know, other, other businesses. You know, so what? So, so, so my, my, my point is that you know, I, I mean, yes, government regulation, uh, they do, you know, cost businesses to some extent, but the benefit of that cost shift to another industry. Could well, I think maybe what you have in mind, uh, this was an idea presented by uh, former Vice President Gore. Uh, I think he was making an argument of this kind that uh, there would be prosperity from manufacturing the pollution controls or whatever, uh, the various devices. Now, uh, that would give uh, certain people extra work, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, it, it's prosperity, because suppose the work that they're doing is largely really unnecessary. They'll be doing it, but uh, it doesn't mean that it's prosperous. They're not producing uh, more goods and services. Suppose what we have is an arrangement that uh, uh, is going to lead to less production and it will take more people to produce the same amount of goods. Well, we'll now have more people employed in certain aspects, but uh, that doesn't mean that it's promoting pr uh, prosperity. Yes, Mr. W Go Weatherford. 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 Going back to the haves and have nots of land and day we're talking about, let's look at the quality of have and have not. Number one, there's never going to be total equality justice. That's a Marxist theory that's uh -huh. gone, you know, there's okay. never going to be no equality. All right. What is the quality of the poor today 
versus the qual in the United States versus the quality of the poor in the United States 100 years ago. 100 years ago, when you were talking poverty, you were talking about a person who might not eat that day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Today, when you're talking poverty, and in my business, I deal with a lot of, a lot of people who are have not. You know, um, no satellite they, TV. yeah, there's no satellite TV. These people have housing, they have clothing, they have entertainment, they have cell phones, they, they have transport, their own private transportation in the form of an automobile. You know, when welfare was invented, or just after welfare was invented, people went to the home of the welfare recipients. They weren't allowed to have television. They weren't allowed to have anything. Today, it's a given that they have them. So you all these poor people, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people in the world that would like to have that standard of living that our poor people have. You know. I think that's a good observation that what we're calling poverty is itself at a vastly higher level than it used to be. Uh, yeah. And then yeah. That, didn't you say that the, that the United States and Great Britain were closest to free market during this time he's talking about, when the poverty level, when there was child labor, when people were, yeah. were, were not having enough to eat, were working right. factories during that right. time, it was the freest market, but the standard of living was so far lower than it is today. Yes, but now, you see, you have to ask, what existed still earlier? Like what were conditions in the Middle Ages? You see, uh, the, the modern world began uh, it, at the level of today's Bangladesh, or maybe lo lower than that. And uh, the, you know, the population of the world was uh, frozen pretty much at about a billion people for many, many centuries until the 18th century. Uh, despite a very, very high birth rate. Uh, it was very common uh, for women to have 10, 12 children, but uh, only one or two might make it to adulthood because you had incredible infant mortality. Uh, I remember reading some years ago, this may not be true any longer, but uh, perhaps a generation or so ago it was, that uh, the average newborn American child had a better chance of living to age 65 than the average newborn Indian child had of living to age five. Now, uh, think of that sort of thing across the world. Uh, think of conditions, uh, the, the primitive state of medicine. Uh, if you lost a tooth, there was no dentistry ever to replace it. Uh, if you broke an arm, it would never be set properly. Uh, all kinds of diseases were very common. Uh, people were very malnourished, uh, su subject uh, to to plagues, uh, life was a horror. Uh, there was a movie some years ago, I think, uh, with Sean uh, Connery, I think in the name of the Rose or something, uh, that gave a good indication of the horrible poverty of that period. Uh, there are some others. Uh, people couldn't afford new clothing. Uh, they'd be wearing woolen clothing, second, third, and fourth hand. Uh, you can't wash wool very often. Uh, they would be commonly lice infested. Uh, uh, people who were somewhat better off uh, wouldn't allow uh, average people en entry into their house because they would stink so badly. Uh, people were filthy, uh, pockmarked, uh, diseased. Uh, the average height of people was much less than today. If you go into a museum and you see suits of medieval armor, well, the average height of, a, of an adult male in Western Europe might have been a little over five feet because of uh, miserable diet conditions. So that's where the world started. That was the kind of poverty. And then, uh, slowly and gradually, things started to improve. It's true, uh, the work week was horrendously long. Conditions were horrible. Uh, pay was miserably low. But let's consider what sorts of things improved this. It was the fact that there were some uh, more uh, adventurous uh, individuals, entrepreneurs, businessmen. Uh, th their first successes were uh, in making the low-cost, mass-produced clothing. Uh, the first industry of the Industrial Revolution was the cotton textile industry. And who was it producing for? Who were the customers of uh, the machine-produced cotton textiles? Not the wealthy ladies and gentlemen, but uh, miserably poor people. They had mass production for the masses, and for the first time in history, poor people could get 
new clothing. And uh, there are improvements in agriculture, uh, the iron plow, the steel plow. Uh, decade by decade, there were improvements. And you could see it in population figures uh, in Great Britain. Uh, the population by 1825 uh, was probably double what it had been in 1800 uh, after previous centuries of stagnation. Uh, the working conditions were still miserable, but uh, the, the market, by virtue of raising real wages, you see, what these improvements do, there's newer and better goods. They're more efficiently produced. And all of these improvements can be thought of as adding up to increasing the supply of goods in the market relative to the supply of labor in the market. Uh, as you increase the output per unit of labor, there are more goods relative to labor. So what is the effect of that on prices relative to wages? If we have more goods relative to labor, prices are falling relative to wages. And what's that do to the buying power of wages? It raises it. It's raising real wages. So conditions were improving. Now, if you have a generation or more of this, let's say you start out, there are many, many people who barely to survive need to work 80 hours a week. Because if you produce miserably little per hour and you have certain minimal indispensable requirements, the only way of living is to work horrendously long hours. Well, suppose because of these improvements in the output per hour of labor, uh, a generation or two later, uh, the real wages have doubled. Well, that puts a lot of people in a position in which they could afford uh, to earn less than double, to, have to work 60 hours instead of 80 hours, perhaps, or 70 hours instead of 80. They don't earn quite as much as they could, but they don't die if they work shorter hours. They can afford to work shorter hours. Well, as more and more people would prefer to work shorter hours, how does that make the market start to offer shorter hours? So you just think if you're an employer and there are large numbers of workers uh, who have a preference for a shorter work week and they're willing to back that preference by accepting wages that are a little more reduced than the hours. Like they'll work seven-eighths the hours but uh, do so at 65% of the wages then won't you start offering that? Won't that be the economical thing to do? Sure. Well, that's how the market shortens the work week. It becomes economical as more and more workers have higher real wages and can afford to work shorter hours. And if that's what they want, then the market brings it about. And in a very similar way, it brings about improvements in working conditions. Now, suppose uh, people need to work a certain number of hours uh, to satisfy their requirements, and the government steps in and compels them to work less. I suppose we had a political party today that would say, you crazy Americans, you're working too much. What are you killing yourselves for? Let's work 30 hours a week. Would the government be doing us a favor? No. 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 If we work three-fourths, what should we expect to happen to how much we produce? We should produce on the order of three-fourths. And what should that do to the prices we'd have to pay? That would go up. And even if our weekly wages stayed the same, even if they said, okay, uh, we'll make the employers pay you that much more per hour so you'll have the same amount per week, well, still, if we produce three-fourths and prices are four-thirds, our standard of living is three-fourths. Well, have we been benefited by a compulsory shortening of the work week? No. Uh, analogously, uh, there was child labor. Uh, apart from the case of orphan children, who made the decision whether a child worked and how much? The parents. The parents did. Now, as the real earnings of the parents got higher and higher, they were in a position to keep their children home longer. So maybe in 1800, there were children working in some areas as early as the age of five. But by 1850, it might be on the order of 10. By 1900, maybe 12. Today, 25 in many cases. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now just think, uh, by the same token, uh, you know the story of Swiss Family Robinson. Suppose there were a social worker who visited Swiss Family Robinson and saw they're having the children gather the firewood 
and do various other chores, and they wrote a report, this is unhealthy for the children, they need to rest and uh, have an education, and then the social worker comes back with a policeman to impose this. Would that be helping Swiss Family Robbins? No. no. And when you stop uh, child labor in miserably poor families, do you think you're helping them or making them poorer? You're making them poorer. If, if children in Bangladesh are producing soccer balls, that's very unfortunate that they have to do that, but are they better off being able to do that and earn something uh, to avoid starvation uh, than not to be able to have even that? Are we helping them by boycotting uh, their soccer balls? I don't think so. Yes? Um, all right. Now, I realize this is a macroeconomics class, mm -hmm. and I personally am converted to capitalism. Mm -hmm. I was, like, after my first economics course, okay? Okay. But my problem is, is this, is that probably the majority of people in this room are all employees, and mm -hmm. as employees in the United States, we pay almost 50% in taxes, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, due to an upcoming, you know, election... 50% of the taxes or 50% of, of our income? Near, close to that. Let's just say 40%, whatever. Okay. okay? Yeah. Of our take-home income goes to taxes, okay? Mm -hmm. And and so then, and I realize that there's a lot of inefficiencies with unions, okay? Yeah. You know, I love shopping at Walmart because I love Walmart prices, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, which is a non-union store. Yeah. But, um, and so I realize that there's inefficiencies with unions. And then I also realize, you know, so what are the, you know, unionized grocery stores and unionized uh, airline employees doing? They're, you know, shifting to these kiosks and these self-checkouts, you know, so they're going to the machinery, right? And so, you know, in the short term, you know, you're going to have flight attendants or whoever out of the job, and you're going to have cashiers out of the job because of the, the, the machinery. So, because the unions can't fire them or also get sued by the union, right? Or the, the grocery store can't, you know, fire the employees or lay off the employees, you know, et cetera, right? Because of the inefficiencies of union. Um, but, but so we're in a capitalistic, uh, free market economy that we pay like a lot of taxes, right? And if we elect the wrong person, we might have to pay more taxes, right? But that's another story for another day. But um, so on an individual basis, right? I go and I work for corporate America, right? Fortune 500. I'm going to try and cor climb the corporate ladder, right? Yeah. I'm going to pay 50% of my, you know, income to taxes for the rest of my life as an employee, right? And so um, I guess. But corporate America has no loyalty to me, right? Like, they, if something goes wrong in the economy or something goes wrong in the company or even in my personal life, yeah. I'm disposable, right? Yeah. They could fire me like that for yeah. anything. Yeah. But yet, if I'm in a union, right, then I'm somewhat protected. So on an individual basis, like, you know, my pro-union, really I'm not. But, like, you know, I've seen the consequences of working in corporate America, you know, as an employee and, yeah. you know, people getting disposed of like that because you know, they took more than two weeks vacation because they had a crisis in their family or, yeah. you know, the company had a downturn or whatever. Yeah. So, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious, what do you, how do you see that, like, on an individual basis, like, you know, people okay. suffer the consequences? Right, first, I would say, uh, I don't know wh why you say we have such a free economy. The very fact that there are people paying 50% of their income in taxes, right, right. that's uh, depriving them of half their freedom with respect to their income. Right. So that's uh, not very free. Now, it's certainly true that uh, a corporation has the, the right to fire a non-union employee uh, with very little notice at its pleasure, but by the same token, you have the right to quit. Now, uh, if you want uh, guaranteed employment, uh, the other side of that is uh, you're not going to be able to leave either. Right. Now, uh, it doesn't have to be as hard as it is to find an alternative job. It's very often the case that if you lose a given job, you're faced with really taking a plunge uh, into a kind of abyss because you may not know where you can turn. Well, the solution to that, uh, to make it possible uh, for people to relocate with minimum hardship, is to make the economy as free as it possibly can be. So you just think, if you lose, you lose a given job because you've lost a competition, now that means you have to enter as a new competitor somewhere else. Mm. In what type of economy would you like to have to do that? In an economy that's wide open to your competition, mm. where anything that you're capable of doing, you can try to do, or an economy that's more or less substantially closed, where in order to get employed, you need to be have seniority in a union. Oh, I see. Okay. See, the, the more uh, uh, controlled the economy is, the, hard, the worse are the consequences of losing a given job, 
and it's a, it's a kind of paradoxical. Uh, the more controlled an economy is, uh, the greater is the burden uh, that bear, bears down on, on people who are left with some degree of freedom, and they think that they need controls to protect themselves. So uh, you think you need to belong to a union. Well, you wouldn't need to belong to a union if the rest of the economy were open to your competition. You should really be moving in the opposite direction. As an individual, I can be just, just as disloyal to the Fortune 500 company as they are to me because, you know, I'm just out and there's, I can yeah. come across, you know, Coke to Pepsi like that. And, and you would. Yeah. You would, and people do. Right. What so, is, yes. What does that do to uh, productivity? Which? With, when there's that lack of freedom. It seems that uh, the uh, desire, the motivation to earn or to be productive is driven by a desire to attain. So if you're yeah. not able to attain, are you likely to become productive? But if you're deprived of the ability to improve, then you're not going to be productive. Because so if you had lack of these, lacking these freedoms, you can't attain as much. Yeah, to the extent that uh, you're not free. See, the, the basic thing is, to be free means what you're free of is the threat of physical force by other people, above all, by the government. Or you get taxed to no end. Well, getting taxed to no end, that's a violation why, of your freedom. Why increase your earning if they're going to take half so why become more efficient? Well, that's a serious problem. But you see, in the nature of the case, if you're free, and you will then be free to pursue your self-interest. You'll be free to do good to yourself. And if other people can't resort to force and they want to deal with you, what do they have to do to get you to deal with them? They have to serve your self-interest. You have mutual self-interest. When people are free, they're each out to serve their own self-interest, and if they can't resort to force, they have to serve the self-interest of the people they deal with. So you have this tremendous uh, synergy. Now, to the extent that people are not free, what not being free means you are prohibited from serving your self-interest or you're compelled to act against your self-interest. That's what happens when you're forced. See, if you weren't forced, you wouldn't voluntarily act against your self-interest. It takes force to make you act against your self-interest or to stop you from acting for your self-interest. So then self-interest is less well served. I'm sorry to have held you That's up. okay. Uh, another comment. I, I think the reason the free market system works so well in the United States as opposed to other countries in Western Europe is because of the, the ability of social mobility here. You can be born into a poor family here and go on to become the President of the United States. Most countries in Western Europe, if you're a working man, you always stay a working man and do the same thing as your father. So the people are more likely to want to adopt the socialistic systems, whereas here, People are always striving to do something better. They always want their kids to be better than they were. It seems like the system works better, and the other countries, not so. Well, I, I'm sure there, there is a broad overlap uh, that what you say has a lot of uh, application. But I would think if a country is truly free, then that means that uh, someone born to working class parents, uh, but who has uh, the ability himself, that there would be nothing to stop him. But most countries in Western Europe, well, that doesn't happen. if it doesn't happen, it's because uh, the, there are such networks of wheeling and dealing with government intervention. You see, suppose you live in a society where, in which to do anything, you need certain critical political approvals. Well, who's going to be networked in a way to achieve to obtain these approvals? Well, someone with the right background and connections. And if you uh, don't have any of that, you just may not be able to break through. But if, if the government was less involved, then you wouldn't have such need for connections. So I would say the perpetuation of that kind of system is probably the result, not the cause, uh, of the problems. Now, I, I see a certain restlessness. Uh, is my uh, watch slow? I have 22. Pardon me? That's right. Okay. But... Uh, yeah, last question. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, I think I, I perceive a desire to, to hit the road. So, all right. I think tonight's class has been very interesting, and I'm very glad so many of you have participated. And I, I look forward to seeing you all next week. Have a great week. All right. Tonight, 
uh, we start going into the uh, subject of money. And uh, what I want to do to introduce the subject is uh, to indicate its enormous importance, the existence of money. Thank you. Uh, without exaggeration, uh, our whole modern civilization, our way of life, uh, indeed our very survival, uh, depends on the existence of money as an economic phenomenon. We all know how important money is to each of us individually. Uh, uh, what I'm out to show now is that there is really no good way of conducting an economic system uh, without the use of money. Uh, what depends on money, the uh, link between the importance of money and our lives and well-being, uh, is the division of labor and the fact that we all live as uh, specialists. Each of us devotes uh, pretty much his full working time uh, to producing or helping to produce just one or at most a very small number of things which are overwhelmingly and in many cases entirely consumed by other people and at the same time uh, what each of us consumes is produced overwhelmingly or entirely by other people. Uh, just think of how each of you spends his uh, working day. Uh, I doubt that any two of you are doing uh, exactly the same work, even if you work at the same company, uh, you probably have somewhat different job descriptions. Uh, each of us works as uh, a specialist, and uh, each of us supplied uh, by a vast host of other people. Uh, things have not always been this way. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the world's population, even today, uh, lives in a very different way. Uh, they devote the far greater part of their labor to producing for their own and their own families uh, immediate consumption. So a farmer in rural China or rural India and many other places in the world uh, devotes the far greater part of his time, the great majority of it, uh, to growing food and producing other necessities for himself and his family, and only very minimally is producing for the market and only very minimally is supplied from the market and therefore uh, from the labor of other people. Uh, the fact that uh, we do specialize and uh, apply our labor, uh, each of us to the production of just one or a few things, uh, this permits an enormous increase in the amount of knowledge that enters into the productive process. Uh, each uh, specialization has its own unique body of knowledge. Uh, in contrast, uh, a society of self-sufficient farmers uh, there's essentially just one body of knowledge, a uh, very body of knowledge to be a self-sufficient farmer. And that body of knowledge is uh, duplicated uh, by all the millions and tens of millions of people uh, living in the same way. Uh, but here, in a division of labor society, we have as many different bodies of knowledge entering into the productive process as there are uh, uh, specialized occupations. And each of us benefits uh, pretty much from the totality of all this knowledge uh, in our capacity as a consumer. When you buy anything, you are implicitly uh, and indirectly getting the benefit of all of the knowledge uh, pertaining to production uh, that uh, entered into the products that you're buying. So when you buy an automobile, uh, you're getting the benefit of the knowledge of the people in the auto plants, uh, the people in the steel mills that supply the auto plants, the people in the iron mines, etc., etc. And of course, uh, the benefit of all of uh, the engineering uh, feats and the uh, scientific discoveries that uh, preceded the engineering advances. Uh, you're getting all that when you buy an automobile. And similarly, for each and everything else. So each of us is the beneficiary of an enormous uh, quantity of knowledge. And uh, the fact that we use so much knowledge in production uh, makes it possible to produce products that would otherwise be impossible. Uh, if uh, the body of knowledge was limited uh, to what one farmer and his wife could hold 
or one farmer and his wife plus a few neighboring villagers, uh, it would be unthinkable uh, to attempt to produce such a thing as a jet engine or any uh, complex product. And uh, virtually all machinery comes under the heading of complex products. Uh, there is no one uh, who holds all of the knowledge required to produce such a simple thing as a ballpoint pen, uh, let alone a lathe or a, a, a cotton weaving machinery or whatever. Uh, machines and complex products in general are possible only when there's this broad body of knowledge uh, in the division of labor society, and also access to an enormous uh, range of raw materials, uh, which is another aspect of the division of labor. Uh, in the division of labor society, each geographical region uh, concentrates on whatever advantages it possesses, or largely concentrates, uh, on its uh, advantages in the way of minerals uh, or uh, special climate conditions for growing different crops. So uh, in that part of the state of Minnesota, where the Wasabi Range uh, is, exists, which is immensely rich in iron ore, uh, there is a significant concentration on the production of iron ore. Uh, they're producing far more iron ore than is locally required than uh, the rest of the country and much of the rest of the world gets the benefit of that iron ore. And similarly, uh, people in oil-producing regions are producing far beyond their own consumption, and uh, raw areas get the benefit of that. And to make uh, machines or any other complex product, uh, you generally need access to a considerable range of uh, materials. And that's an aspect of the division of labor, too. And then, uh, without uh, going much further into the subject, uh, there's a major dynamic element in the division of labor society, and that is that a substantial proportion of the most intelligent, most ambitious members of such a society concentrate on specializations concerned with the acquisition and application of new knowledge. Uh, these are the specializations in the various branches of science, uh, engineering, and also, very importantly, business. A major aspect of business activity is the uh, seeking out and the actual instigation of uh, 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 engineering and often scientific advances that will make possible the production of new or uh, more efficiently produced products. Now, none of this uh, would be possible to any great extent in the absence of the existence of money. If we would not have the existence of money, uh, we would have minimal division of labor. Now, uh, just think uh, as to why this would be the case. Uh, suppose uh, we didn't have money, and money, I should point out right away, is a good uh, a leading or essential characteristic of which is that uh, practically everybody in a given area is eager to accept it in exchange for whatever it is that he himself produces. Uh, money is the one thing that uh, everyone in a society is eager to accept in exchange for his own goods or services. Uh, some people want uh, Dell computers, others want Chevrolet automobiles, but uh, nobody, not everybody wants uh, either of these items, uh, certainly not very often, but uh, everybody does want money uh, pretty much all the time. And uh, this means that uh, once you come into the possession of money, if it is something that everyone does want, then it's a simple matter for you to turn around and obtain whatever it is you want. Because of money, uh, life is greatly simplified in that all you have to do to get whatever it is you want from other people is to find a way to earn money. And this uh, is what makes possible the enormous uh, specialization it's what makes possible the division of labor uh, being carried to the point where it is today. Uh, each of us is in a position to live uh, by doing uh, virtually anything uh, that uh, some number of other people are willing and able to pay money for. We can specialize in anything that uh, any other people are prepared to pay money for. Because then, once we have the money, uh, we can easily turn around and obtain whatever it is that we want uh, from other people, from third parties. Now try to imagine that money did not exist. Uh, here you are, you've been growing, uh, going into uh, 
your grocery store, uh, whatever, uh, buying clothing, uh, paying your monthly mortgage payment. Uh, how many of you are doing uh, a kind of work that your grocer uh, needs or needs very often and reliably? How many of you are doing any kind of work uh, that your mortgage lender uh, needs or needs very often? I doubt uh, that that's a significant element. So I think how many of you are engaged in activities uh, that, uh, how many of you are engaged in producing uh, for international trade, for uh, goods that are going outside the state, or outside uh, Orange County, or outside uh, the particular part of Orange County uh, that you live in? Uh, I think virtually all of us uh, is engaged in producing for people uh, who do not supply us. And each of us is supplied uh, almost entirely uh, by people for whom we do not produce. And if it ever became necessary that uh, in order to be supplied, we had to produce something that the suppliers wanted, well, uh, that would uh, pretty much destroy the division of labor society. I just think if in order to obtain food, uh, you had to produce what farmers wanted, well, what range of opportunities would be open to you? How could you live if uh, money were destroyed and we were back to the days of the exchange of goods for goods, bought the direct exchange of goods for goods? Well, either you'd have to go back and live as a farmer to have food or uh, produce uh, the limited range of things that farmers uh, frequently want. So maybe you can get by as a blacksmith, uh, maybe you can get by as uh, some kind of veterinarian, but uh, there wouldn't be too many other opportunities. And in the absence of money, uh, the division of labor would be pretty much wiped out. Yes, uh, Mr. White uh, I, I have a question about that. Um, I have, um, I mean, I've got a friend who's a dentist, but I also have a friend who's a lawyer, and sometimes mm -hmm. they create services mm -hmm. right, through the United States. Yeah. But then, also the fall of the economy in Argentina, um, you know, on your sheet here, uh, like I, I read about the sort of that there was these, I don't know what you want to call them, these bartering uh, clubs that you didn't ever barter your food for services because, you know, there was, they were so, you know, the inflation was too loose so they couldn't depend on any currency it was almost worthless so they just decided to barter their goods for services in these bartering clubs and there were more bartering clubs, you know, per capita, you know, since, you know, I don't know, for 1300 or you know, whatever it was, like, recently when, you know, the economy in Argentina was like collapsing. You know, what they actually do, uh, which uh, really fails them out, is that they use the foreign currency above all dollars. Right, dollars, they so, right. And um, if the Argentine government didn't uh, forcibly oppose it, uh, the money of Argentina would probably be dollars. I think Ecuador uh, uses dollars as their money. And uh, you say also Panama. Right. Uh, there will probably be many of the smaller countries around the world that, uh, if the development were not actively opposed, uh, would be using dollars as their money. Because their own monies are uh, very, very poor. Now, uh, when they destroy uh, their local money, so long as there is an alternative like dollars to turn to, mm -hmm. well, uh, that even plays a role in whatever barter exchanges they may have. Because how would they know uh, how many loaves of bread uh, to exchange for a television set or whatever? I think you could be sure they were insulting uh, the prices of these things uh, outside the country in the world market. Uh, if uh, you had to uh, literally have a physical exchange process, well, think how time-consuming and costly it would be. Uh, how, would, how could a firm uh, pay its workers? Let's say uh, you're producing uh, ball bearings. Now, uh, could you pay the workers for the ball bearings and say, okay, uh, now you guys go and, and barter the ball bearings. Uh, you get some bread and you get some milk and whatever. Uh, I think that would be a practical impossibility. Uh, so uh, if you uh, really do destroy money and there is no uh, substitute money that can quickly take its place, uh, that's uh, destroying the economic system. And that uh, plays a major role in explaining the collapse of ancient civilization. Uh, the Roman Empire in the first and second century AD had uh, a considerable degree of division of labor, uh, the greatest up to that time, 
and it probably wasn't surpassed perhaps until the 15th century in modern times. And so that was followed uh, by centuries of self-sufficient uh, production that was feudalism. And what played a major role in that was in the uh, 3rd century AD, uh, the Roman government, through a century-long policy of inflation, constantly expanding the money supply. They were collecting gold and silver coins and taxes, uh, repeatedly melting them down, adulterating them with lead and copper to have more coins to spend. Uh, by the end of the century, uh, the coins had virtually no precious metal content and the Roman government uh, wouldn't accept its own coinage in the payment of taxes. And that's when people had to start paying sheep and goats and all right. And at the same time, uh, they prohibited the development of a new precious metal money because uh, they were seizing any private gold or silver holders. And so they destroyed money in the Western Roman Empire. Uh, that caused them to revert to feudalism. Uh, it prevented them from having a paid professional army. Uh, they were overrun by the barbarian tribes. So uh, the destruction of money is destroyed there. Um, someone here, uh, Mr. Richards, yes. Could it be advantageous to us as a country to have other countries in the world who bought the dollar as their currency? Or is it advantageous? Would it be advantageous or disadvantageous for other countries in the world to adopt the dollar as a currency? Uh, now, to some extent, well, there are, many, there are hardly any countries that actually use the dollar as their formal total currency. Uh, the dollar is demanded uh, pretty much throughout the world uh, to provide a kind of cash reserve. Uh, in most places of the world, you really wouldn't want to count on the local currency at all. And so uh, I doubt that uh, anyone would be stashing away uh, Polish Zlotys. I think that's uh, their monetary unit uh, or many of the other uh, currencies. And so uh, people uh, do have holdings of dollars. And it's estimated that perhaps half of the uh, paper currency outstanding from the Federal Reserve is actually held outside the United States in the form of the uh, 50s and $100 bills. Now, is that uh, advantageous or disadvantageous? Uh, there's one sense in which it's advantageous. Uh, every year, uh, our government issues uh, new and additional dollars. Uh, uh, some uh, portion of these new and additional dollars goes outside the country and uh, brings in uh, goods and services in exchange. And so, to that extent, the United States is in the position of uh, manufacturing paper money at hardly any cost. I just think, what does it cost to print a hundred dollar bill uh, on a volume basis? Uh, probably less than a penny. So uh, it's costing the United States Treasury uh, pennies in effect, and uh, American citizens are getting uh, several billion dollars worth of goods each year. <coughs> now, uh, ironically, uh, this is uh, presented in the press without realizing what's actually involved as an object of complaint. Uh, this comes under the heading of the unfavorable balance of payments. See, to this extent, to the extent the dollar is used uh, globally as a cash reserve, and, and there's more dollars being created each year, then some part of the new and additional dollars leaves the country uh, in exchange for goods, and uh, we don't get those dollars back in exchange for exports. And a lot of people complain well, we're importing more than we're exporting. To the extent that uh, paper dollars are created and leave the country, uh, we're importing goods, and uh, we have that much less paper. Now, I don't see how this is uh, really a disadvantage. Uh, where it could be a disadvantage at some later point in time uh, is uh, the policy of the United States government ever gets to be perceived uh, negatively so that people don't want to hold dollars abroad and they decide uh, they want something else rather than dollars, then what will happen to those dollars? They'll come rushing back uh, to the United States. Uh, there'll be a vast flood of new of additional money uh, that will have to circulate in the United States. And what do you think that would do to its buying power? It would greatly reduce it. 
uh, the export of the dollar itself to restrain the effects of domestic inflation. You are, is that Mr. Ayer? Okay. What about uh, people that work here in the United States and earn money but send money to another country to support family outside? Yeah. How does that affect our economy? Well, how does that affect our economy? Uh, well, I would think, uh, to a large extent, uh, the people in the other country, or the people that they buy from, uh, they then buy goods from the United States, in one way or another. Or, to some extent, as I just explained, uh, maybe some of that money will reside in the foreign country. Uh, I'm sure there are many uh, people of Mexican origin who are remitting money to relatives in Mexico, and uh, some of that money undoubtedly uh, accumulates as additional cash holdings of Mexicans. Uh, and to that extent, uh, there are goods and services uh, that have been obtained. Uh, and uh, we, we have paid for them, in effect, uh, just by the creation of money at, at the cost of pennies. Yes, sir. Uh, um, so, what is that the the well, the advantage to them is uh, by people spending remittances, uh, the relatives who receive remittances are able to buy things they otherwise couldn't have bought. That's the advantage uh, to the recipients of remittances. Uh, the main advantage to people in the United States is, uh, well, the, the advantage to an individual is, uh, you're getting some good or service from someone of Mexican origin, and they're happy to perform it because you're paying them dollars. Because I was, when I went to Mexico, I was, because I haven't been here before, I was surprised that they were able to take my phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they were more than happy to take that over, you know, Mexican money, so I yeah. Well, you see, the Mexican money doesn't have a very good record or very good prospects. Uh, not too many years ago, there was a major depreciation. Uh, I forget what the uh, peso, the older peso went from uh, back, I guess it was in the late 90s, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, suddenly its value plunged overnight, and whoever was counting on these pesos uh, suddenly woke up and found they had lost a substantial percentage. And so people don't want to hold pesos knowing that that uh, is uh, something that can be repeated. So they'd rather hold dollars. Uh, yes, so that's the right. And now I get the case goes back to the case. With the movement of a single type of money here, for example, do you see any of the more and more of money being you know, you yourself or your credit card response or check that has a substantial cash? Yeah. Do you see any I think you're asking really uh, two questions. Uh, one is the question about a single currency and the other is a uh, paperless currency. Okay, now it's possible that we could have a paperless currency. Uh, I don't think we'll see it anytime uh, soon because they're, they're small transactions. Now we do a lot of, uh, uh, most of the spending is in the form of uh, checks or electronic uh, transfers. Uh, so to that extent it's, it's paperless. Uh, I don't think that's a very critical issue. Uh, the key thing is there's some limited amount. Uh, it has to be certain assets in connection with it. But uh, the other uh, point is, can there be a single currency? Uh, there could be a single currency, but in fact, at one time, uh, surprisingly in the past, uh, there was uh, essentially a single currency, or two currencies, uh, the precious metals, gold and silver. If all of the uh, individual countries were on the gold standard, uh, then the separate monetary units would just be different denominations of the same money. And at one time, uh, until the early 1930s, uh, the dollar 
uh, was defined as approximately one twentieth of an ounce of gold. Uh, the British pound was defined as, as approximately one fourth of an ounce of gold, which meant that uh, it would be approximately five dollars equal to uh, one pound. And the dollar and the pound, uh, so long as both currencies were gold currencies, uh, they represented essentially one currency. And most of the world uh, was on the gold standard uh, prior to uh, certainly World War I. Now, uh, you'd have a universal money that again all of the different countries or major groupings uh, adopted the gold standard. Uh, it's conceivable there could be a uh, paper or a, quote paperless paper money uh, meaning non, non-precious metal uh, a global such money uh, it's conceivable but I doubt very much that uh, it could last and I uh, have doubts about whether the euro can last either uh, because uh, there's an essential question that comes up and that is uh, which of the different countries will get how much of the newly issued money and will they all be content to agree to the same rate of increase in the quantity of money and just think, look at things uh, from recent history if you're comparing uh, the Dutch and the Germans on the one side and the Italians and the Spaniards on the other uh, do you think they had the same ideas about what is the appropriate rate of increase in the quantity of money in their country <coughs> uh, who do you think would favor uh, what kind of policy do you have any information on this well, the greatest advantage, but uh, I'm asking now about uh, the rate of increase in the quantity of money. How would they perceive the advantage of their country? Uh, like how would the Dutch and the, and the Germans uh, view what will be best for their countries? Would they, would they think that the rate of increase in marks and uh, Dutch guilders uh, as rapid as the increase in lira and pesetas would benefit their countries? Would the uh, Spaniards and Italians think a rate of increase in lira and pesetas as, mo- as modest as the rate of increase in marks and guilders would be a good idea for their countries? Well, which would this assume it stays in the country? And what is your name, sir? Keith Wilson. Keith Wilson. Uh, what do you think uh, they would perceive as being beneficial? Uh, a rapid rate of increase, a la Spain and Italy, comparatively rapid, or uh, comparatively slow, a la Germany and Holland? Uh, Mr. Novaki? Nicolo Vaxi. Well, it depends on the economic um, benefit in the country. For example, in Bulgaria, we are part of the euro because so-called third world country, but the Arab would be much more beneficial to get the euro. Okay, uh, and many individual people in Bulgaria welcome the euro uh, in the same way that people in Panama and Ecuador and Argentina uh, welcome dollars. But the question is, uh, if you look at uh, the politics of Bulgaria, uh, do you think the Bulgarian politicians and the, prog- and the pressure groups there uh, are all uh, content uh, to uh, have uh, the quantity of money in Bulgaria uh, increase uh, no more rapidly than the supply of euros? Or uh, would they rather be able to have a, a more rapid increase in the quantity of money? Well, control it to make it slower or faster? I uh, think faster. Uh, do you think that the Italians and Spaniards will be content uh, if the monetary policy of the European Central Bank uh, is governed by the Dutch and the Germans? I don't think so. They'll think that's too slow a rate of growth. On the other hand, would the uh, Germans and the Dutch be happy uh, with the monetary policy geared to uh, the, what we assume is the wishes of the Italians and Spaniards? I don't think they could be happy. Now, uh, so it's difficult to see how uh, the different uh, countries can be satisfied 
for very long. They have different ideas about what's an appropriate policy. Uh, here in the United States, uh, we uh, have just been emerging from a, a fairly significant recession. And isn't there disagreement about uh, what the Federal Reserve and the government should be doing uh, to counteract the recession uh, prevented from deepening? Uh, is there agreement uh, that uh, what's being done is the only appropriate thing or that other people would like to do something different? Aren't there uh, some people uh, uh, connected with the bond market particularly who are concerned that we've had uh, too loose a monetary policy? And there are others uh, who are concerned with uh, slow job growth who have been saying how the monetary policy has not been loose enough and there should be more rapid extension. Right, so there's disagreement here, and it's a political disagreement. Now imagine that the disagreement becomes connected uh, with a divergence of nationalities. So uh, one policy is identified more heavily with one or, or a few nationalities, the other policy with other nationalities. Now, just think, uh, what can the implications of that be? There are people who are angry about uh, what they perceive as a wrong economic policy. Uh, now, uh, Terry is blaming Bush, and Bush uh, will be blaming Clinton, and, uh, and uh, arguing with Terry may make it worse or whatever. But suppose on top of that were added a nationality factor, so that a political party would be saying, well, it's these damn Germans who are responsible uh, for the economic problems with Italy. And in Germany, they'd be saying it's these damn Italians who are responsible uh, for our economic problems. Uh, I don't see how that can easily be overcome. And uh, if it isn't, uh, it's hard to see uh, how one can look forward uh, to the Euro and the European Union uh, in Germany. Now, I don't think we hear too much talk along those lines right now, but I think this is a long-run consideration. Mr. Sweeney. How do they convert that into well, they just reintroduce uh, their uh, traditional currencies. And in many of the uh, areas, uh, you know, the euro does not yet circulate throughout. Uh, the newer member states like Hungary, uh, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, they're not actually using the euro yet. I, I learned that uh, the hard way when I made a trip last summer as a tourist. I flew into Budapest with a uh, what I thought was enough euros to pay it for a cab or whatever. And then I learned that uh, they're still taking the Hungarian florin. And so uh, they're not scheduled to actually use the euro for several years. Uh, the British aren't using the euro. And I would imagine that uh, it wouldn't be so difficult uh, to reintroduce the mark in Germany. Uh, they would probably introduce it uh, one mark equals so many euros or a fraction of the euro. Uh, it would probably be easier than uh, than having you introduce the euro. Uh, yes, sir. Miss uh, Nicola. Well, the original question was, um, the euro has been very strong and higher than the dollar. But the dollar is being used um, primarily to trade in our the world. So mm -hmm. how come the euro is going stronger than the dollar? Why is the euro, why is the cotton stronger than the dollar? I would say it's the very, very low interest rate policy of the Federal Reserve. Uh, see, when the euro was originally introduced, I believe in 1999, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it started out as equal to a dollar seventeen, and then within the next year or two, it quickly fell to eighty-four cents, and now uh, since that time, it's recovered, I think, to a dollar twenty-seven or something. Or how much? One five zero. I don't think it's been that much. It's dollar twenty seven, I think, and it's been the peak. Maybe at some uh, crooked retail exchange, <laughs> especially in Prague, uh, you might end up paying something like that. But uh, I think the uh, regular wholesale rate hasn't gotten above the dollar twenty seven and dollar twenty eight, and. Uh, what's responsible is uh, interest rates, short-term interest rates uh, in uh, the Eurozone are uh, significantly higher than in the United States. So that means uh, people who want to invest money short-term, uh, there are more of them likely to buy Euros rather than dollars. 
the money that uh, would have been deposited in the U.S. at a higher rate is instead uh, put over uh, in a euro investment. If our interest rates go up uh, relative to the euro interest rates, uh, the, the dollar will improve relative to the euro. Yes, Jane. Um, the understanding though is that uh, I thought maybe any corporation the political instability does political stability or instability play a role in the value of the currency yeah, yeah very very definitely uh, if uh, the more uh, the political instability uh, the greater is the likelihood uh, that the governments of such a country will resort to a policy of more rapid increase in the quantity of money uh, in order to pay their bills. So if there's political instability, are people going to be eager to invest in such a country? I mean, after all, what does political instability mean in the last analysis? Uh, how does it affect uh, individual investment decisions? Suppose you thought uh, the governance of some country is unstable. What would that mean? Oh, it means... Pardon me? Probably okay, what can happen if the government is unstable, but it's seriously unstable, uh, maybe you have a revolution there, uh, maybe some crackpot political party takes over, or a coup, and you don't know what they would do. Uh, what does that do uh, to the security of property uh, and the, the value of contracts in such a, kind, in such a country? Uh, it makes the risk much greater. So would you want to uh, have investments in such a country, no, you prefer no. not to. So uh, people won't be buying that money for investment purposes. Uh, they may be attempting to liquidate investments they have there, buy other monies. So that will make that money depreciate. And uh, then the, the tax revenues of such a country will diminish. Uh, the government will still have the same expenses, or still greater expenses. And how may it very well uh, find the money to pay for those expenses. Manufacture more of it, and well, that depreciates the money. So, political instability uh, weakens the money unless it creates doubt about the value of investments, the security of property, and uh, the quantity of such a money. Yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Davis. Davis. That was a good example that was just a couple years back in uh, Baja, California, or Mexico, or locally. Yeah. So the government took over uh, all of the American Red Cross. And so what we have now is there's a system of education here. There's all these half built condominium complexes and, and all these structures that are half built. And we're like, why does he throw that money in that? Because all the American money. That's who's going to continue to put money into something that the government has. 